Hi, everyone. So my name is Alon. I came all the way from Tel Aviv, Israel, to talk with you about the one thing I am most passionate about, which is obviously football. <laughs> yeah, anybody here likes football? No, rugby, huh? <laughs> so I don't know anything about rugby. If anybody can teach me the rules after this talk, I'd be happy. But I really like football. Anybody recognize this team? No, it's a hard one. It's a Scottish national team. No, nobody knows, obviously. But the reason they're here is because I was in Scotland a few months ago. Now, many people, when they go abroad, they like to go to art museums, art galleries, whatever people like to do. I like to go watch football games. So I was in Scotland. I want to see a football game. And you see, I'm not Scottish. I'm not a redhead. So I, I didn't know how to actually order the tickets. So what do you, you do when you don't know anything? Google, yeah, I Google it. Google, are there available tickets for Scotland versus Ukraine? So at the time, there was no JGPT. Now we have better options, but I Google it. So Google gave me the answer. It still didn't have like the answer, but it redirected me to a site where I can actually buy the tickets. Well, this is what I thought, because I pressed this button down there, and I was redirected to another site. Now we can really buy tickets. OK, thank you. But then I was redirected to another site, hold on. First, into select seats. I was pretty happy. At least there are available seats. This is what I thought. But wait a second. First, you need to register an account before you do anything, right? So when I started to register the account, I got this first task. So far, it was really easy, just like following the yellow brick road. But now I was having like a real task. I need to fill out my name, my address. Pretty easy, right? I know my name. I know my address. But then when I finished that, I got the real hard task, password. All right, and not just a password, it has to be, let me read it for you. Password need to be eight to 64 character long, contain one uppercase, three lowercase, one number, one special character. I had to read it like two times before I gave up. I thought, well, I don't have a good password to that. I grabbed some snack and I forget about these. So it's really important, security is really important. But you don't want to lose some customers in the funnel. You also want to have like a good UX, right? You don't want to lose customers because you have a lousy UX. So why are we still here talking about password? Is it the 1990s now? We have so many new means of authentication, like fingerprints, face recognition, signing with Google, signing with Facebook, signing with Spotify, signing with whatever you have today. Why are we still here talking about passwords? Well, apparently, only 2% of the websites in the internet today give you the option to opt in with anything that is not a password. 99% of the websites will only let you sign up with a password. So yeah, in the future, hopefully, we, don't, we won't have any more passwords, and you have many like, more advanced techniques to sign up. But at least for now and for the next few years, passwords will still dominate the internet. And what's the, pass what's the problem with password? It's probably the number one security breach that we have today, security like problems. So security breaches, like data breaches, cost more than $2.7 billion a year for companies. So more than $2.7 billion are stolen a year, and it costs $2.1 trillion for companies. So it's a huge problem, right? And hopefully, I'm sure you all have the best expert, best security expert in the world today, right? You have the best people. But, you know, it happened to Facebook, it happened to Instagram, Microsoft, Apple. That bridge has happened almost to any big company. And also, they have really the best talent today. So if it happened to them, it might happen to you. And if it happens to you, if somebody puts their hands on your databases, hopefully it's all like hashed passwords with insulted hashed passwords. But the only line, like the last line of defense is if your users have a good password, right? If your user has like lousy password, it's gonna be cracked in a second. If not, it's going to take much time and your, your users will be more secured. So it's important for you also, not only for your users. So you might say, okay, that's like an easy task. Let's just add more means of security to FA or more means to make our security stronger. But again, like think about the last time you signed it to a, to a website, you put in a password, then it tells you, no, it's not strong enough. You put another password, still not strong enough. Then you put a really strong password, 
then you get an email, so you go to your, your inbox, you press the link, then you get an, another SMS to your phone, and then you need to grab your phone, but it's in the other room. All these just to sign up to a site, right? So if we just add more and more minimum security, we also make the experience more complicated. But on the other side, we can compromise security, right? We still want to have good security. So the solution is probably somewhere in the middle, like giving a strong advice to your users, how to use security and how to increase their security. And obviously you want to stay somewhere, you don't want to ignore security at all. You want to stay somewhere between the advice and required. Depends, again, on your, like your, your website. If you're working for financials or something that really requires strong security and UX is maybe not that important, you can go to the, the, the edge of requirements or you can also find, find some balance maybe for some sophist like sophisticated users, sophisticated advanced features. You can require them to use strong means of security, for example, or just like push them to use some things with notifications or emails. So let's talk about how you start. Like, let's say you have a new product and you want to build security features for that. And the best way will be like, first let's talk about builds. So for example, you have your release, this is from Facebook, all the, all the features that they have. And I, I took a look on the, probably the, the, the most popular sites today, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and all that. So what they all have in common is some set of features, for example, logins, Password estimation, two-factor authentication, also device control that you can the, to control the connected device, web sessions, also recovery. How do you recover when you lose your password? And session control, you know, the one that lets you sign in in a few days, how much time you can be idle. Alerts, for example, if you see new sign-outs, suspicious activity, and data control. So this probably is six, like six, examples for security features that you can build, really generic features. But also it's important to think about your specific use cases. So this is an example for Zoom. It's really pretty little, so you can see, but I just highlight, so I redo the, the more common words here, like meeting, passcodes. So it's a really specific features for Zoom. So it's not, you can start with the basic, just like common features, but also remember to add your specific security features according to what you build. So once we build the security features, we need to set the enforcement level, right? So this is just an example where, I, I don't remember which site, but you can put the password, it doesn't matter which password you put, just let you continue. This is like not reinforcing. This is like giving you advice, so you can put any password. It will tell you if the password is weak or not, but just advising you, it won't block you. And on the other hand, you have like the site that actually blocks you from putting like weak passwords. It's an example for enforcing like levels. This is another example from Google. So in Google, you can sign into Google without activating the two, the two, the two factor authentication. But once you want to be a developer in Google and upload, for example, Chrome extensions, you will need to add the two factor authentication, right? So they're starting with enforcement level and then they add it if you want like advanced features. And then it's not, don't bury all your features, just like in the pages, like in setting pages. You probably want to also encourage your users to increase their security. This is an example from Dropbox where you have like six steps which will help you increase your security in an easy way. We do have all the settings pages and advanced pages, but also we try to encourage our users. It's another example, if you have Android, you've probably seen that. It tells you warning what, what you have good and what you can do better to increase your security. Right, and also in an example for Facebooks, from time to time you might say that they are actually pushing you to increase your security. They're not forcing you, but they do encourage you. And the fourth thing is for B2B ones. So at Dropbox, we have the B2C, you probably all know it. it's like an uh, application that lets you sync your files as a, as a personal, but also we have teams, businesses that can buy, can purchase Dropbox for all their teams. And each one of these teams have an IT admin that can configure more advanced features. So we do have like the defaults for all the users in terms of security, but we also give these admins the permission to change the security for their teams. Okay, so for example, if we talked about two-factor authentication, two-step verification, so we do have the default, which is we don't force users, but the admins for their teams can force it. Another example, device approval, so we, we let you 
connect how, how like the number of devices you want, but admins can control the number of devices for their team, for their business. Another example, web session control, again, you can be connected how much time that you want, but admins can configure for their team the limits of time that can be connected. So when this admin came to us and asked us to build this panel, as you can see here, it's like password requirement. This is a password requirement panel that they came up with another competitor that we have. And in this panel, admins could configure the minimum required characters, the, if they require numbers or not, the number of numbers, the, uh, if they require special characters, the number of special characters, and so on, and so on, and so on. Many checkboxes, many numbers, many job downs, many things to configure here. And we saw this panel, what our competitors have, and the requests that we have from our customers, and we thought, well, maybe we can do the same thing, giving you the same power, but easier, with better UX than having all these job downs and checkboxes and all this panel. And the way to do this is asking what we found is five, asking the five whys. Now, if you know, if you don't know the five whys, it's a technique started in Japan car manufacturing, in which if there is a defect, you ask five five time why until you understand the real root cause of a defect. So you can also use this in the in product, right? If somebody asks you a client come to you, ask you to build something, you can ask them five times why to understand what they really want. Right? What the problem we're trying to solve. So when customer came to us and asked us, hey, I want to have the same password control as your computer. And we were like, okay, why do you want that? And they said, okay, I want to force my user to use long password with special characters, number, and so on. Okay, now we understand better, but why do you want that? We are okay, they're trying to get pissed off, but I want more control over my user's password. Isn't that clear? Okay, you do want that, but why? Then they say, I want them to use strong password. Okay, we're getting somewhere, but why do you want that? I want to reduce the risk of account hijacking. Okay, last why, why do you want that? Well, I want my team files to be safe, so all they want is to keep their team files safe by enforcing them to use strong passwords. So, if we want to build that, we first need to understand what a strong password is, right? So, if we put here two passwords, one is a Tubador, also with my illustrations, Tubador with some tweaks, and the Blue Giraffe plays ball. So, let's do a short poll now, rising hands. Who thinks the first password, the Tubador, is better? Raise your hands, nice. Who thinks the Blue Giraffe plays ball is better? Nice, it's like 50-50, right? So, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> but the first lesson we learned today is what do you do when you don't know something? Yeah, you Google it. So Google, what's considered to be a good password? And the answer I got from Google is, as you can see, a good password must consist three, four elements. It has to have six characters or more, mixed cases of upper and lower case, numbers and special characters. So I took these two passwords and put it into a table, and let's see, and as you can see at Chubador House, all these elements, well, Blue Giraffe plays ball. Not so good, right? So, good work for the one who voted for the Chubador. It's a, it's a better password. But when I went to sleep, I recalled a story I really, really liked as a, as a kid. It's called Alibaba. And in Alibaba, oh, sorry, not this slide. It's not this Alibaba, it's this one. So <laughs> there's a really no famous password, right? Open Sesame. And Open Sesame didn't have all these numbers, special characters, upper, lowercase, all this mess. Because passwords were invented long before we even had computers. So there must be a better definition for a good password. So what do you, what do, you do when you don't find the answer in Google? You go to comic books. So I went to XKCD, and they have a much better explanation for what is a good password. And a good password must contain contains only two elements. It has to be hard to guess, but still easy to remember. That's all you need for a good password. So let's talk about hard to guess. What's hard to guess? Hard to guess is really basically the number of guesses required to crack the password. And if we need to estimate it in a naive way, it will be the cardinality 
in the power of the length. Okay, it's a little spooky. So let's do an example. So the cardinality is the range you have, like the number of options you have for a single character. Now, if you use only the lower case alphabet, you have 26 options. Then if you add the, the uppercase alphabet, the numbers and special characters, you have 95 options, right? And then if you take a six random letters password, if you use like the only lowercase, it will be 26 to the power of six. But if you also add uppercase and numbers and square characters, you have 95 in the power of six. So in the rate of 1,000 guesses per second, the first one, only lowercase, will take you 15 days to crack. And if you add also the square character and so on, it will take you 140 years, right? So now you can see where all these rules come from, right? More lengths, the longer the password is, the more cardinality you add, the better the password will be, or the harder it will be to guess. But we're humans, right? We're not robots. So I can tell that at least for me, I'm not sure about you, but at least for me, just remember six random characters with special characters, number, and so on, almost impossible. And if you have, if you have many passwords, it's even harder, right? So what almost all the people tend to do is they use some templates, right? Not just random characters, right? So, for example, Troubadour is a good example, right? You have Troubadour, which is a word in English. It's an uncommon word. You can find it in a dictionary of the size of 2 to the power of 16. So you have 2 to the power of 16 options. Then they just, like, uppercase the first letter, like all the people do. Two options, either you do it or not. Then they also use some lit here. Lit is the transformation, the visual transformation of some letters. You only have like, like for example, O turns to zero, A to four, and so on. For some reason, I'm not sure why people think it's really sophisticated, but you only have like eight, like eight rules or so. So computers can crack it really easily. It only confuses yourself, so <laughs> yeah. It's probably not a good thing to do. And also, you have like special character. One of the, you have 16 options, another number at the end, 10 options. And then the order between them you have two options. So if you sum all this up, you find out that this is only takes like two to the power of 28 guesses to crack, only three days. That's all. Because we're using a template, it's not random, right? It's not all the letters here are random. What about Blue Giraffe Baseball? You have four words here, pretty common. You, know, you can find it in a dictionary, smaller, two to the power of 11. And if you sum this all up, it's 550 years. Now, I don't know about you, I, I don't tend to live so long. So it's actually uncrackable, yeah. And so that's harder to guess, right? But which one is easier to remember? Obviously, it was a trombone question mark three. Or no, no, it wasn't that. It was Troubadour's question mark. No, no, it wasn't that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and we listed some letters, the first O, the second O. Uh, fuck, I don't know. Like, I've done this talk a few times before, and honestly, I don't know what's, what's the original password. No idea. But, you know, Blue Giraffe plays ball, stays Blue Giraffe plays ball. Right? So that's much easier to remember. So we now saw, like, which one is, is better. Let's talk about a much more easier password, right? Password 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, exclamation mark. Now let's analyze this. It only has three parts. One is password, take you one guess, right? It's the first password in any dictionary. Second one is one, two, three, four, five, six. The second one in any dictionary. Then you have an exclamation mark, one from 16 special characters. And yeah, it takes you a second, just like 19 guesses to guess that. You don't need all this calculation. You see, it's really a lousy, lousy password. So I took this password and put it into the biggest websites today. I want to see how they are going to estimate this password. So I started with Google, with Gmail. I put this password into Google and, yeah, <laughs> full bar. This is a very strong password, obviously, yeah. This is what Google told me. I thought, well, you know, maybe it's only Google. Maybe Facebook will do a better job here. Nah, also strong password. Maybe Twitter, <laughs> nah. <laughs> also, I got like full bar in Twitter and Apple also full bar. Oh, sorry. So as you can see, these sites, not only that they're wrong in their estimations, they're also misleading you to pick uh, weak passwords. 
So what if we had a tool that we can put a password in it and then it breaks into the actual part, more realistic estimation than all these random like rules? Well, we have one, it's called ZXDVBN. This is why I'm here, you know that we're gonna have one. It's Viva Dropbox like 10, more than 10 years ago by Dan Wheeler. It's open source in MIT, so you can use it or do whatever you want with that. And it's really the, really popular, it's the number one realistic password estimation today. And if you want to use it, real simple, if you use like uh, npm install, node, or if you use other language, just install it, require it, and use it. It's just like one line of code, just zxdvbn, it's, by the way, zxdvbn is the letters in your keyboard, in the bottom line. So zxdvbn your password and you get the full analyze, a more realistic analyze of your password. It's really fast, it's implemented in many languages, almost any language today, any popular language. It's fast, only five to, 12, to 20 milliseconds for up to 25 characters uh, passwords, and it's lightweight, less than 50 kilobytes, and the data, the, like the dictionary of the password, take about a megabyte. And actually, Bill Burr, he was the one who came up with all these rules. A few years ago, he kind of regrets all these, all these rules. He came up with these rules in 2003. And 2016, he regret all these rules. He said it was like a huge mistake. As you can see, he thought about the naive estimation and not how humans are going to use their passwords. So he regretted, and also the NIST, which is the National Institute of Standard and Technology, they also refreshed their recommendation. So no passwords in it, hints anymore. No knowledge-based authentication is out. All these questions that you have, what's your first uh, last name? What's your first pet name? What did you eat for breakfast today? I know like all these questions are not recommended anymore. Also no more experiment, exp expiration without a reason. Obviously what people do is they did the password and then they added the counter at the end. Probably know it and then you increase your counter. So this is also not recommended anymore, and no composition rules. Composition rules is the rules that we saw with all these special characters, numbers, and so on. So they are no longer recommended. Cool, so now when we understood what a good password is, instead of building all this for our customer, we built this. That's all. You have a password strength and you need to choose. You have one drop down. Either you don't want a strong, either you don't want to force your user to use a strong password, strong or very strong. Three options. That's all they actually needed, right? So it was a win, win, win situation for all of us. It was a win for us, like developers, designers, product, because we can do that much faster, right? We don't need to think about all the designs. Also, we just needed to call like the ZX CVBN. We didn't think about all the edge cases in the way. Like what happens if you put there a checkbox and then you remove it and then you change something. We didn't need all that. So it was really fast to develop. Also, it was simple for our admins, right? They only need to make one decision. They don't need to see all these checkboxes and drop downs. They don't care. They just want to do one thing. And it was also a powerful to our end users because instead of giving them wrong advices for how passwords should be, we have a much more powerful tool, a more realistic estimation. So a win-win-win situation for everyone. Cool, that's all. So let's talk about the conclusion. So what's the conclusion? We, we started about first finding the balance, how to build, so we talked about building the basic feature that probably all the sites need, like login session, devices, all these. Then we talked about deciding the enforcement level that you want depends on your product. Then encourage your users, don't hide all the features in just like screens that it's almost impossible to get. Then if you have a B2B product, also give, delegate some of the decisions to your admins. Then we talked about specific use case, which is password estimation. We talked about why, why, why should you care about it? So it's like the one number one data breach. What can you do and how? And probably this was just a, a one use case, but if you can take some general lessons that we learned today is don't automatically build everything your customers ask you to, as you see, the customer will only ask you to build like copy from your competitors 
or things you've seen before. They're not really artistic. So don't automatically build everything the customer asks you to. Try to think out of the box. But first, try to understand what they really want. What's the problem they have? Not the solution they want to build, but what's the, the problem they have. Ask them the five whys to understand the root cause of their problem. Then, as a technological person, you have like your smart, smart algorithm, either AI. It's things that some, sometimes, for example, product managers, designers can come with more sophisticated solutions, right? They a lot of times don't know about algorithms, about the more sophisticated ways of authentication. So use like, your power to help your designers, your product, to come up with smart algorithms. The one that we saw here is, was a dynamic programming algorithm, something that product managers couldn't think about. But again, we have more AIs today and more APIs that you can use maybe to help your customer, instead of letting them put all the details. So think about smart algorithms, use your superpower. And if you want to do this, probably want to start early, conver early conversation with your product and designers. Anyone here, any engineers here? Almost everyone, engineers, yeah. So as an engineer, really don't be a code monkey. Don't just like grab tasks from your Jira and do this. Try to be like really connected to the product, see, like understand your customers. If you can go like to talks with the customers and really see them in your eyes and understand the problems in their words. Any product designers? No, <laughs> only engineers right? or managers. So yeah, so if you can talk again with your designers, try to be more involved in their work, ask them to be more involved and use your powers to come up with good solution. Because only if we work together, product designers and engineers from the very first step of a project, we can build products that are both secure and also have a really good UX. That's all, so thanks for Dan Wheeler, uh, thanks for XKCD obviously for coming up with this great comic and thanks for Dan Wheeler who built this library inspired by XKCD. And thank all of you, obviously, I, it was me, so I'll be around here if you have any questions. If you want also, I really appreciate if you can connect with me in LinkedIn, if you have more questions or you're shy, I always appreciate questions. And if you can also give me some feedback here, and you can also win a prize, so why not? <laughs> and also I can, you know, I really be happy to hear like any feedback that you have so I can improve. Yeah, and go some feedback and that's all, so thank you very much. And do we have some time for questions? Yeah, we do have. Thank you, thank you. So, so you mean like what do you, okay, so I'll just repeat the question. If the admin selects the strongest option, what do we actually enforce the users? So we do have like the, the library returns like if you put it any, like any password, it will return you a number from, I think it's from zero to five, how strong is the password, so we use this. So for the strong, like the, for strong we use, for like if, if you use no enforcement, it's zero, if you use strong, we use two, and for very strong, we use four. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, so if anybody, I'll stay here. If anybody wants to ask me a question personally, I'd be happy. Thank you very much.